Let's go over the parts of the transfer case. This is actually the key to these transfer case swaps. And then when she's broken loose, just take it nice and easy. Jimmy jams itself right out. All right, this is where the magic happens. When you pull this out, there may be some gunk on it. God heard our plan and swiftly chuckled and threw us a curveball. Uh, cur What's up, Buck Doug with Dean in the garage? Obviously today, talking about transfer cases. Uh, I am in the process of doing a transfer case swap on my 2001 Jeep Grand Cherokee WJ. Some of you know, Project Dan gave me this 242. I'm gonna use some of the parts from this 249 that Eric and I pulled at the junkyard. Uh, we're gonna put them together, make a hybrid case that'll work in my Jeep. In the process, what I wanna do is go over every aspect of a transfer case swap. There's a ton of information out there on the internet about it, but there's two issues. A lot of it's incorrect, a lot of it is uncertain, and almost all of it is incomplete so if you're trying to research how to do a transfer case swap you're likely running around like a chicken with your head cut off uh, trying this site has information on drive shafts this site has information on compatibility but let's go through every single aspect of a transfer case swap down to yokes and drive shafts spline counts input shafts compatibility everything I don't usually do this but in the description, I'm definitely going to put timestamps because this is going to be a long video. So if all you're looking for is X, go down in the description, down there in the squawk box, and you'll be able to find, you know, minute five, skip there if you need drive shafts, minute whatever, because uh, I'm going to indulge my enjoyment of talking on this one. And we're going to just try to get all the information out there. So without further ado, uh, let's dig into this. All right, to start with specify, this information is going to be applicable for a lot of transfer cases out there in the world, but most specifically, it's for the new process, new venture transfer cases that are used by Jeep, Dodge, Chrysler, and even GM. Uh, they use this style transfer case, not always the exact same casing, but the internals often are uh, compatible. There's actually a really good video by Bleep and Jeep where they take a 231 Jeep transfer case and they put the internals in the in the shell of a 233 S10 case so that uh, the S10 can use it and it works fine. It's great. So uh, this is applicable for a wide range of vehicles. And the interesting thing about the new process, new venture cases is that the cases are almost identical. These are two different transfer cases. Right here is a 247. It's uh, an all-time four-wheel drive, meaning there's no two-wheel drive option on this. It's kind of in an all-wheel drive all the time with the viscous coupler. Um, this is out of a 2004 Jeep Grand Cherokee. And if you look at it, you can notice that it's really very similar to this 242 that um, is out of a 2000, I believe, XJ. And it's the same if I had a 95 XJ or a TJ or whatever. You're gonna see the actual shape of the case, where the bolt holes are, are all very similar. Um, and it is for that reason that it's so easy to do swaps on Jeep, Dodge, Chrysler, GM products. Let's go over the parts of the transfer case real quick, just absolute down to basics. So you're looking at the front of the transfer case here. This is where it mounts to the transmission on almost all, certainly all modern Jeep, Dodge, Chrysler, trucks and SUVs, this mounting pattern is the same. So you can take a transfer case out of a Dodge pickup truck and make it work in a Jeep or make it work in, um, you know, vice versa, whatever. So the first thing you have is your input shaft right here. This is where the power comes from the transmission. This is actually the key to these transfer case swaps. Now these shafts, all transfer cases have them obviously, but they can be different in three ways. The diameter, the length, or the internal spline count. Now on these two, the XJ242 and the WJ247, the spline count is the same. They both have 23 uh, spline uh, inside diameters. They are also the same diameter. Usually if the internal spline is the same, the diameter is the same. The spline usually dictates the, di the diameter. The difference, obviously, is the length that they stick out. Uh, if I were to try to put this transfer case on this Jeep, uh, this would make contact and probably damage the transmission. Conversely, if I try to throw this one right in my Jeep, this is not gonna be long enough to engage the output shaft of my transmission enough. So, to make these two cases compatible in opposite vehicles, the most basic way, you take them apart and you swap out these output input shafts. 
Now this is possible because as they're the same diameter, the input bearing is the same size and inside the planetary gear set is going to be the same. The only time you can't do this quick hot swap is if the diameter is different, meaning the input bearing is different. Now you're still not sunk because a lot of times you can just swap over this plate which holds the input bearing. That's what makes these cases so customizable and um, so swappable between vehicles. It's one of the reasons that I love uh, Jeep and Dodge products is you can really find a transfer case for your needs and with a little bit of work and time on the internet, you can figure out how to make it work. All right, staying on the front of the case, we've got the input shaft, we've got where it mounts to the transmission. You have your linkage selector over here. It's gonna be different depending on what vehicle you're on. On the 247, it comes out the top and it's real tall. On the uh, XJ242, it goes to the bottom and it's a little shorter but it's always gonna be right here. Most of the time when you do a swap, you wanna keep your vehicle's original arm. So this arm is gonna end up on this 242, I think. Right next to it, you have the front output shaft. All right, this is what goes to your front drive shaft. Now, this is a U-joint style yoke, meaning there's a, a U-joint, obviously, at the end of that drive shaft. But a lot of these have a cup style receiver on the front. And it looks like this. And what it holds is, it's called a Razipa joint, and it's basically uh, a CV joint. It's basically a flat CV joint, and um, they used them in a lot of the entry level uh, light duty so, uh, Jeeps. So if you got a four liter Laredo Grand Cherokee, you probably had a Razipa front end. As you can see, it, it fits right on, and it looks the same at the end of the day, uh, it's just the style of joint. Now most people prefer the U-joint style. They're stronger, they're easier to replace, and they're cheaper to replace. Uh, and when these things go bad, they make a racket. I had one, I bought a WJ real cheap because the previous owner thought the transmission was going. It was just the Razipa joint that fits in here. So if you have the opportunity, a junkyard swap, get a different transfer case, get a different um, output shaft yoke, and you can switch from a Razipa to a U joint. It's just another thing to keep in mind. Um, you may have to swap that over, you may not. So confirm what, what output shaft you have in the front and confirm what uh, output joint the donor transfer case has. Now, if you have to pull one of these, the best way to do it is on the vehicle. You lock the transfer case in four low uh, and then you're able to break free this nut. Now the nut on almost all of these, all the ones I've ever encountered, is one and one eighth inches or 28 millimeter will work. All right, now here's the thing. If you're a goof like me and you forget to do it while it's on the vehicle, you have a bit of a problem, especially if you have the Razipa style because you can't wedge it, can't wedge anything against it. So, Bleepin' Jeep actually makes this. It works like this. So if, let's say you get, like Project Dan brought me this transfer case. I had no opportunity to pull the yoke when it was on the vehicle. So I took it off with this um, yoke tool that Bleep and Jeep actually sells. I bought it from him years ago. Uh, they sell it on their website. I would highly recommend it. <clears throat> uh, whatever sins Matt may be guilty of committing against rare XJs, if that man designs a tool for Jeeps, go ahead and buy that tool. It's probably dead useful. The man's a genius. All right, so you bolt it to your yoke, like so. Then you have a few options. You can either get a pipe on here, or I like to just put a breaker bar in the little breaker bar, half inch breaker bar hole up there. You'll notice mine isn't crazy tight. I don't have the right size bolts, doesn't matter. <clears throat> I've got an inch and a quarter, or inch and an eighth right here, that we slip down in there. Now these things are gonna be tighter than a, turtle's backside, so you can try, but if you got the thing moving, now would be a really good time for an impact gun, because an impact gun will pull that right off, or a buddy to hold you, I don't have either. So what I do, oh, I use the mechanic's most ancient friend, big chunks of pipe, get some leverage on it. Now usually I do this on the shop floor, not, not on a table, but this is for science for you people, so I'll try to juggle it. And away we go. Oh, easy peasy, right? Just like that. And then when she's broken loose, oh, you can just work it. All right, and most of the time these just slide right off. Um, 
but they are RTV'd on. There's RTV right here, so sometimes you have to persuade them just a little bit, but <clears throat> they're almost all the same. Uh, so they're very swappable if you wanted to get um, a switch from the Razipa to the yoke style. In fact, as you can see, these are the this is the XJ one, this is the um, WJ one. You can see they're identical in diameter, spline count. They're the exact same part. Uh, they even have the same part number, 19056. They both have it stamped right there. <clears throat> so as far as determining compatibility for your swap, you don't really have to worry about the front shaft too, too much. Now additionally, um, you'll notice they all have a breather tube in the same exact place because again, looking at the back of these, this is, this is the same part basically. Uh, something they may have different though, right here is the um, shift selector sensor. Uh, so on a vehicle with like the 231 or the 242 that came in the XJ and the WJ and the TJ, um, if you're in part-time, if there's a little light that goes on in the dash or if you're in four low, this is the sensor that tells you. The 247 has no need for that, so you see it's completely missing. Now when I put this in my Jeep, the sensor is going to be there, but I don't believe the thing to plug it in is going to be. Uh, it's only four wires. I believe if I wanted to, I could probably figure out how to wire it up. I have read walkthroughs where people did learn how to wire it up. Uh, I'm not going to miss it. I will just do it the old-fashioned way and look down at the shifter and figure out what I'm in. But it is doable to add this to a vehicle uh, that didn't have it like this, but uh, for my purposes, I'm probably not going to. Now moving to the back of these cases are where things really start to look different, and these are this is where you easily visually identify a case if you see it out there in the yard. Uh, for starters, um, you're gonna notice on anything that came from an XJ or a four liter WJ, it's gonna have a speed sensor here. On the V8 WJ, the speed sensor is in the transmission, in the 545 RFE transmission, so it doesn't need a speed sensor. Um, that doesn't mean you couldn't use this transfer case in this vehicle, and we'll get to that in a minute. Obviously the most uh, useful thing for identifying these transfer cases is the identification tag. It's found right here on the back of every single new venture, new process case, um, and it's got a ton of information on it. If it's red, like this one, that means it came from the factory. Um, if it's got a blue ring around it, it should, will likely say Mopar somewhere. Somebody had it replaced at the dealer at some point. Uh, I actually have a four liter WJ out in the driveway that has a blue one because the previous owner uh, must have blown up the transfer case, had the um, dealership put a new one in. So if you see that blue ring, it's still the same setup. It's the exact same case, just means Mopar put their own tag on it. That's really all there is. So you're looking at this thing. The first thing you encounter is 247J. That's the case identification number. That's what this is. Now, each of those digits means something. I'm not gonna go into it here because I have a 20 minute video on it, but if you wanna know, I can not only tell what transfer case it is, but uh, two means something, four means something, and seven means something. It identifies the um, application uh, and the um, operation of the case. So I've got a video, I'll link it up in the corner if you're interested in that. Underneath that, you have assembly number and serial number, and below that, you have the gear ratio. Uh, a lot of people hit me up and say, hey, I have a 272 transfer case. No, you don't. You have a 247 that has a 272 gearing. To my knowledge, and I am pretty knowledgeable in these cases, the only two numbers that really matter are the model number and the ratio number. Neither of these actually tell you anything useful. There's nothing hidden in there uh, that's gonna give you more information about the case. After that, on the back of the case, you have the fill plug and the spill plug. The way you change the fluid in these is you drain it all out of here and then you fill it up until it's coming out of here. Here's the thing. These drain plugs are steel. This case is aluminum. What do we know about the uh, different metals dance, all right? It does crazy things. I've seen people strip these out, break things. So what I always say is, when you're going to do a fluid change, take your fill plug out first. If for some reason you can't get your fill plug out, at least you still have fluid in your transfer case. Nothing's worse than you get the spill plug out, and then you can't get the fill plug out, and now you're, you're beat, because there's no fluid in there. Um, so I have seen these things do some crazy things. Um, make sure you use the exact right size uh, Allen key, I can't remember offhand what it is. I'll, I'll write it somewhere. Um, additionally, this 247 uses a viscous coupler. It's essentially a limited slip, very similar to the Verilock differentials that WJs use. So it uses uh, gear oil with friction modifier in it, just like your transfer, your uh, differential would. 
whereas most of these transfer cases use automatic transmission fluid. 242, 231, uh, but uh, I'm not sure about the 249, I can't remember. I'll, I'll write that down there too. Uh, but make sure you know what fluid goes in your case. Most are gonna take ATF, but if it's one of those all-wheel drive uh, transfers, power on demand type things, there's a good chance it takes something else. And this information is true also of the newer cases um, that went in some of the newer Jeeps with electronic shifting. It's the same case, it's just being shifted electronically. All right, let's talk about the tail cones, uh, the output shafts, and the drive shafts that go with these. This is, in my opinion, the hardest part of the swap. Now, first of all, these tail shafts are great for identifying the transfer case. Uh, anytime you have a rubber boot like this, you're looking at a 242 or a 231 for the most part. Anytime you're looking at a conical hard tail like this one, you're looking at either the 249 or the 247. Those are the all-wheel drive transfer cases found in the Grand Cherokee. Um, additionally, there's another type that you may encounter it kind of looks like this, but then instead of having a rubber boot, it's um, got a long, hard tail shaft. <laughs> Insert joke there, right? Um, uh, slip yoke. Those are usually your HD cases, either a 242 HD uh, from a Grand Cherokee between, I think, 02 and 04 or something like that, um, or a 231 HD out of a Dodge truck. Now, those are highly sought after. They have the same function as the light duty version of, of uh, each case, uh, but they're much beefier. They can handle a lot of abuse, so people look for those. I am going to talk about the HD cases in a minute, but for now, we're going to focus on the light duty cases and the 247, 249. Now, inside this tail is obviously the output shaft. This is what spins your rear drive shaft. Now, these tails are so vastly different, it doesn't look like there's any way they could use the same drive shaft, but in reality, they're both 27 spline uh, output shafts. And they both will use, this is a chunk of drive shaft, they both will fit the same drive shaft. Come on, don't make me look dumb. See? There we go. Now what that means is there's a good chance you can use the drive shaft that's already in your Jeep, but what you have to figure out is length. And here's what I mean. From the base of this plate, now we've already decided that the rest of this case is basically identical, so this measurement will be accurate. From the base of this plate, to the end of the output shaft, let's call it seven and a half inches, all right? Now on the 242, that same distance is, let's call it eight and three quarters. So that's significant. We're at seven and a half, eight and three quarters, we're an inch and a quarter off. So because this transfer case is longer, the drive shaft that's in my Jeep now may or may not actually fit. Um, now these are slip yokes, so what happens is this drive shaft is splined on the inside and it fits on there. And as your Jeep moves up and down your suspension, this slides in or out to essentially make the drive shaft longer or shorter. Now the question you have to answer is, does that travel allow for the difference in size? I'll give you one example. My 2000 WJ is lifted three and a half inches in the rear. I also swapped the two, uh, sorry, the Dana 35, which is a short differential for a Dana 44A, which is a long differential. Now, what that means is I had to, my, my, dip, my drive shaft now needed to be shorter. Because it was lifted, it didn't matter. I was able to use the same um, drive shaft. I'm not sure for this swap yet if I can use the same drive shaft. Now, this case uh, is, what we decide, an inch and a quarter shorter. Because my Jeep's not lifted, I'm not sure if my new drive shaft's gonna be too long. Now, <clears throat> the stock drive shaft from my other WJ is a bit shorter, so it may get sacrificed to this Jeep. Um, this is what I'm talking about with the misinformation or incomplete information. If you ask five guys if my drive shaft is gonna work, I'm gonna get five different answers. You get guys, oh, I've done the swap and I used mine. No, I did the swap and it wouldn't work. So unfortunately, it seems like you kinda have to do all the research you can on your specific vehicle and then you kind of just have to try it. Everybody told me that I was not going to be able to fit my stock drive shaft on that other Jeep, and I did. I did, and I've been wheeling with it, and it's articulated, and it doesn't hit, and it's fine. It's perfect. Now, there are other options. Some people trim these output shafts and drive shafts. Uh, usually, it's just a little bit you have to. Now, real quick, we'll talk about the HD cases. <clears throat> the 242 HD is probably the most sought after transfer case for Grand Cherokee guys. Uh, for Wrangler guys, it's the 2410R, which has a super low gear. It's the transfer case they put in the Rubicon. It's beefed up and it's got a super low gear. Um, <clears throat> if you can find one of those, I highly suggest you buy it, even if you don't need it, because it's worth something to somebody somewhere. The 242 HD is something that a lot of people look for in the WJ. Now, here's the thing. 
the spline count is different. It's got a 32 spline input shaft, so you know you're gonna have to swap the input shaft. Um, it also has a completely different back end and none of the other stock uh, drive shafts will fit with it. So you need the rear drive shaft from the vehicle that had the 242 HD in it if it's a Grand Cherokee. Um, I've heard people suggest that they put 242 HDs in Dodges. I've never ever seen anything to confirm that, but if it's true, if you ever find a Dodge 1500 with a 242 HD and you decide to pull it, you're probably gonna have to get a custom drive shaft or find one from a WJ with a 242 HD. What they did put in Dodges <clears throat> were 231 HDs. Uh, and again, since that transfer case never existed in a Jeep, you're probably gonna have to get a custom drive shaft made, uh, but chances are if you're doing a big swap like that, uh, it's probably because you're putting it on a heavy duty off-roader and maybe you want you know, slip yoke eliminator and all that stuff anyway. All right, that's enough talking about it. We might as well get to it. Let's rip down the 242. First thing you're gonna have to do is go ahead and remove the front drive shaft yoke. Uh, you need that removed and it's easier to do now. Next, uh, you can remove this plate. Oh man. Oh boy. These are definitely Loctited in if I recall. That's why we're having trouble. Come on. Oh, these things are real fun to argue with. <clears throat> Alone on a bench, but all it's going to take. If I recall, yeah, these had some kind of Loctite on them. So we will Loctite them again at the end. Alrighty, now this piece is RTV'd on, uh, even from the factory. That's how they're supposed to be. There are pry points. Now, like I said, this is an aluminum case. You want to be very careful about warping or breaking it. So there are little pry points in the side. And you're going to want to get a screwdriver or a tiny pry bar in there and kind of jimmy, jimmy jam it, jiggle it that, that way. Uh, there we go. Just take it nice and easy. Uh, so that you're sure you're not going to break anything. Now, when you pop this guy off, you'll notice there's a divot in the top. Uh, this needs to be oriented the same way when it goes back on as you just took it off. This hole needs to line up with this hole there. Um, that's how it moves oil around. Now what you're looking at <clears throat> is the input shaft, the input shaft bearing. There are a couple of snap rings here that we're gonna have to contend with. I do not have good snap ring pliers, so I'm in for a fight. I recommend you uh, go ahead and get good ones before trying to do this. It's just gonna make your life a heck of a lot easier. All right, what's up, Buck? It's actually the next day. I went out and I bought the proper pliers last night. My camera died and then the SIM card uh, or uh, SD card was all filled up. So I took that to mean that God was telling me to go ahead and buy the right tool for the job. <clears throat> so for this, this is not a snap ring. It's technically a locking ring. So you need these little flat nose guys here. I never had them before, but now I do. And wow, it's so much easier than doing it the wrong way. So moving along now, we can begin to split the case having removed the front yoke and the uh, input shaft locking ring. All right, as you'll see, I spilled ATF all over the place, which is just awesome. That's my favorite smell in the world. Um, once your seals are off the front, uh, your case is wide open, so make sure you're not getting any junk in there, and be careful because that last bit of fluid can come out. We're now ready to split the case. Uh, these cases are held together with 15 mil six-point bolts and 10 mil 12-point bolts. The only 12-point I seem to have around is this crazy wrench that I modified for doing um, oh, 4.7 liter uh, hydraulic lifters. Um, but whatever, you're just gonna work your way around the case, uh, taking them all out. These cases are RTV'd together from the factory and, and they do have factory pry points. So uh, there is a process for getting them out. Now we get to finally split the case. Finally, finally, finally. Gotta do it carefully, the aluminum case. There are two pry points where your screwdriver can go in. One's right here and one's on the opposite side. And what you're gonna wanna do is get them in there. Yeah, there we go. Hear that RTV breaking apart? Just do it nice and slow. A little bit on the other side. This is gonna make such a mess. Oh my God, this thing's gonna bleed everywhere. I've never been very good at getting all the fluid out of these things before digging in. I forgot about the other locking ring in the front. There are two locking rings in the front. One that goes around the input shaft and one that goes around the input bearing. Uh, if you don't pull that out, <clears throat> you're not gonna be able to split this nicely. So that's why I was having all these problems. Uh, it's difficult because it's usually hidden by RTV. So you're gonna have to break the RTV up, find it, obviously without marring anything up. 
but it's right here. Alrighty, there we go. We'll clean up that old RTV before we put things back together, but we can now split our case the way we're supposed to be able to split our case. All right, uh, you've got all your snap ring, lock rings out of the way. You get her stood up and we can start working this guy off. Oh, oh God bit my finger. Come on now. Oh, we lost our chain. Okay, we're gonna take this and put them aside. Now we've got our rear output shaft out of the way with the back half of the case. This is of course the gear uh, and shaft for your front output. Here is your gear selecting ring. Selector fork assembly can be lifted out. Uh, there was a magnet that goes right here. You're gonna wanna pull that out. Oh, you're gonna wanna clean it up. Uh, the oil pump assembly is on the other half of the case, so I'll show you that in a minute. We're just gonna go over the back half real quick. This is gonna be all covered with shavings. Uh, as long as there's no big chunks, should be all right. The whole point of the magnet is, yes, some metal particulates do accumulate in these cases. And um, if you don't have a magnet in there to catch them, well, you get it. All right, once you have everything to this point, uh, you're gonna wanna make sure there's some plastic guards on the shift fork here. Make sure nothing happens to those. If you've got a rebuild kit, you probably have new ones. I recommend you put the new ones in. Now, we need to remove this shifter fork assembly. On the 231, it's easy because it's big and it just slides right off. It is not easy on the 242. It actually <clears throat> kind of really stinks. What you're supposed to do, what they tell you to do, is right down here in this hole, which is covered with this little cap usually, is a roll pin that they want you to use a number one extractor, screw extractor, to back out. Um, I don't know anybody who's tried that method who hasn't either uh, been at it for three days before it happened or just given up. Some people end up drilling big holes in their cases. Uh, there's a much easier way. <clears throat> don't, don't mess with that hole. I would not recommend it. Right here. This is a 7 8 I don't know what the technical name for it is. <clears throat> now you can remove this when the case is put together still, um, and that would make it much easier, but I was busy focusing on you folks filming, so now I'm gonna have to argue with it, but you remove this and then you can wiggle it out. I'll show you how in a second. Oh, that was easy. <clears throat> I'm gonna remove this guy. <clears throat> Here, trying to get you guys an angle on it. This is kind of holding the shift plate in place. It's got a spring, and it's also got another little piece on the end. I recommend taking it all. That way it's not left rolling around anywhere. There we go. When you hear this satisfying clunk when you shift gears, you can thank this little spring and cap setup. I can't remember what it's called. It might be a detent. I'm not sure. All right. Now that we're there, we've loosened this plate enough that you should be able to sneak a screwdriver down in there and kind of pry. What you're doing is this is retained inside the slot of this plate here. You're kind of prying the two apart. Now I know this seems a little bit sketchy, but believe me, the other method is worse. Google 247 roll pin removal and just read some of the nightmare stories on the forums. I mean, guys are drilling holes in the side of their cases to try to get to it. Most of them give up. You don't hear about very many people using the roll pin method that actually get it. Oh, the joys of making videos on the work I do in the garage. So I finally get it out. I look over to make sure the shot is still framed and I realize the battery has died. So I'm not sure yet how much of that you saw, but I assure you, uh, no camera trickery or anything like that. <clears throat> Whoops, that's upside down. Um, you just, you work it to a point where you're able to free it from the plate and then you kind of get under this wing and on this little gear tooth right there and you just give it a little and it jimmy jams itself right out. You wanna be careful, there's some plastic sleeves here to be careful of. These guys you don't wanna lose. Um, uh, those little plastic uh, shift pads there. <clears throat> so, whoops. Now that that's done, and that is the piece that gives 242 swap owners the most uh, heartache. All right. Then this piece will come out with a little bit of jimmy jamming again. There are plastic um, feet on these. You want to just put this stuff aside. I know we got a lot of pieces now, but 
trust me, it all goes back together. It's not as scary as it seems. Right here we have our planetary gear set. All right, this is where the magic happens. Bring you in a little closer, we're gonna free this input shaft. All right, now this is a three planetary gear set. Most of the basic transfer cases have a three planetary gear set. When you talk about the HD cases, they have a six planetary gear set. You can see instead of spaces here, uh, you just have another set of gears that are inherently stronger. More metal, more contact, more beefier. All right, there's another locking ring, snap ring type guy in there. Uh, it's got little pry points. You can see, oh boy, right here and right there, so nice and carefully, we're gonna get them up and work them around. And here you go. This is your input shaft. This is what all this fuss is about. Uh, you can see it's got some roller bearings inside there. Um, this is what you're swapping to make your transfer cases compatible. Most of the time, this is all you're gonna have to do. All right, let's take a look at the back of the case real quick. You got your chain, all right? Here's your front output shaft. Your front yoke would go on here. This is the uh, where the input shaft would go. Your rear output shaft is back here. Uh, like I said, this is your um, front output shaft. We can move that if we want to get to the chain. There's some roller bearings in here that if you have a kit, you probably, uh, that's probably one of the ones that you will um, be changing. This one is notoriously difficult to get to. Uh, a lot of people use strange pullers. I've heard of people using bread, uh, a number of other things. Uh, but that's not something we're gonna do in this one. I may do another video on how to do all the seals and bearings in one of these transfer cases. Now right here you have your um, oil pump pickup. Uh, on the other side of the case is another slot. The magnet <clears throat> that we talked about earlier sits right on top of this. So the idea is fluid is being pulled over the magnet. Metal particulates are getting caught up there. Any other non-metallic particulates are getting caught up in this screen. So when you pull this out, there may be some gunk on it. You can go ahead and give it a little clean. Mine actually looks pretty darn good. You want to make sure you don't disrupt any of this stuff because obviously <clears throat> you're not going to be pumping oil when you're not gonna make it very far down the road. One last quick note on the back of the case, uh, these chains tend to stretch, and that's how you can determine how worn out a transfer case is. Now, when they get real worn out, they'll actually slap on the bottom of the case and make noise. Now, you can see that even though this came out of a Jeep with 220,000 miles, uh, the chain's really not all that stretched. What that tells me is this Jeep was driven in two-wheel drive most of its life. So even though it has 220,000 miles, the power was coming in here, going straight through. There wasn't a lot of tension being put on this chain uh, by sending power to the front. Now, a uh, Jeep that's been off-roaded a lot in four-wheel part-time where these two are locked together, that's when the chains start to get stretched and you'll have problems where they're actually hitting the bottom of the case. The health of a transfer case can be determined here. Uh, and this one's in really good shape. Even though it was from a high mileage Jeep, it was taken care of and um, was not abused. And I honestly believe this was probably a city Jeep um, that was driven in two wheel drive most of the, its life. So that's a win. Alrighty friends, as is so often the way we made a plan, God heard our plan and swiftly chuckled and threw us a curveball. Uh, the curveball in this case is that I got into the 247. This is actually the input shaft. And you know what? It's just way more fascinating than I thought it was going to be. I've never dug into a 247. I've done extensive reading on it, but um, I think it deserves its own video. So we're actually going to close this video out here. Uh, we've accomplished what we came to do. Yes, I need to put all this back together, but you guys don't need to watch me do that. Oh, this is the gear set, <clears throat> planetary gear set from the 247. Sorry, this is the planetary gear set from the 242. I'm gonna slide the one from the 247 in, and away we're gonna go, just like that. You see, it fits perfect, everything spins. We'll get our plates and everything in there, and then I'll be able to slide it right into the 242 and I'll be in business. So I will do a video on the 247. What I think I'm gonna do, since I'm already into this one, when I pull the 247 out of my Jeep, we'll dissect that one. Uh, that way we can do it from the very beginning and really go over it. In my uh, reading, I noticed there weren't too many good videos on the 247. Lots of like hour and 20 minute long teardowns. And I know I'm a little wordy, but I'd never give you an hour and 20 minute long teardown video. No one wants to watch that. Anyway, let's close this out here. I'm sure there's gonna be lots of questions. By all means, leave them down there in the squawk boxes. 
Um, I did my best to make this a complete video with the generic basics that anyone would need uh, for specific questions. Put them down there. I'll try to help. Others in the community will help. Now that you know the basics, you can at least go to the forums to ask about your specific vehicle in an educated way. So this right here is the key. This is what it's all about. Uh, at the most basic level, just switching out input shafts, and then from there, maybe you have to mess around with drive shafts. Maybe you want to do some other little things. I like that. Anyway, um, yeah, let's close it out there. Uh, if you like the video, like the video, by all means, subscribe to the channel. Consider checking this out on Patreon, Etsy, and Teespring. As always, thanks for watching. See you next time.